rights, we want to let you know that when you come to the gathering, you're at a safe place. We're not here to judge or condemn you, but our hope and our prayer is that you will hear, see, or experience something that will draw you closer to Jesus Christ. And my prayer is that in these moments of worship, you've already felt that tug on your heart to just get a little bit closer into the presence of God, because the truth is, only He can satisfy. I'm especially grateful for uh, Pastor Pugh in the house with us. Amen. I'm going to take a moment, if you don't mind, sir, to just introduce yourself, you know, um, to the congregation. Um, some of you all know that, uh, well, you know, you want to tell the story? <laughs> uh, come on, Pastor Pugh, just share with us real quick, and then I'll come up. Amen. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise God. Hallelujah. What a blessing it is to be here today, amen, because my mindset is, amen, I am more than a conqueror. Yeah. That yeah. makes me a champion, amen. Yeah. And he says, well, here, this is the gathering of champions, amen, so I'm in the right place at the right time. Hallelujah. I thank you. Praise God. We're part of an international organization, the House of God Church, uh, and we reside out of Nashville, and uh, our overseer, our bishop, was led to plant over here in Clarksville, and uh, quite frankly, we were looking at things, and God was saying, that's not it, that's not it, and you know, you just have to pray on everything, amen, and be led by the Spirit of God, and we were patient, and more so than a building, I was praying, Pastor, that God would have attached me to somebody that has some grace on their life. Praise God. I wasn't concerned about the worst of things, but I, I wanted to be attached to somebody that was already walking in what we were desiring to do. Praise God. And so somebody knew somebody. And it was a, a Holy Spirit hookup. Praise God. And uh, I just thank God for my brother, Pastor Corey, because he welcomed me with open minds. And the first thing that I, I realized, glory, all the glory to God, that he was kingdom minded. Yeah. It wasn't about an organization. It wasn't about a denomination, amen. But it was about us coming together with the cause of Christ, amen. So I just thank and praise God uh, for being here today. We look forward to collaborating with you. I have my lovely wife, Faith, here with you. I have my assistant, uh, Minister Davidson, here. And we are just looking to come in to learn and to be a blessing to what's already going on. We ask that you pray for us. God bless you. Amen. Thank you so much, sir. We really do appreciate you all. I, um, so, again, I'm getting ready to preach, uh, but I just want to let you know that uh, there's two things that I forgot this morning. I, uh, I forgot my glasses. Uh, <laughs> And so I figured that the Holy Spirit must be up to something. Uh, so it might be a while. No, I'm joking. I'm, joking. No, I, I'm okay. I'm okay. I think I got big enough letters here. And the second thing is uh, I forgot my belt. So uh, so maybe that'll keep me calm. You know, so I don't jump around too much. But I think uh, I thank God uh, for all of you being here. I truly do. I truly am grateful. Uh, as we get prepared to transition from this location to the next location, um, Pastor Pugh and company will be taking over the 10 o'clock service here. about that and we're going to be working together and I just can't wait to see what God has in store uh, for us. But today we're going to continue in the sermon series that we've been on entitled Since You Won't Go to Counseling. We're going to have a little bit of fun today. Um, you might laugh a little, you might cry a little, you might go through the emotional gambit. It's going to be a roller coaster for some of us today, but I think it will be helpful in the long run. Amen, champions. Amen. Amen. So pray with me as we endeavor. Eternal God and Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for this moment. We thank you, God, for your anointing that rests over this house and in this room at this very moment. We thank you for the ears that are here to listen. We thank you for the hearts that are fit to receive. We pray now, God, that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh God, our strength and our Redeemer. It's in the precious and matchless name of Jesus we pray. Everybody who loves him, shout amen. 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 A few months ago, uh, I decided that I was going to start trying 
And I emphasize trying uh, to get back in shape. I, I, I said that I was going to make it a point that every time I went in my garage, I was going to work out on that Smith machine that my wife let me spend about $3,000 on last Christmas. And my son and I spent months putting together over 900 pieces of this puzzle of machinery. So I said every time I step in the garage, I'm going to do a little bit of exercise. I'm going to work out. I'm going to get back in shape. And in addition to working out and getting back in shape, or at least my attempt to, my wife and I decided that we were going to every morning get up and walk at least two miles a day before the sun comes out, before it gets too hot. You know how that Tennessee heat can do. And, and this routine was good for us because my daughter graduated high school this summer. And when she graduated, <laughs> As she graduated, uh, we decided that we were going to take a trip to Orlando, Florida. Some of you all know that we took that trip. And on that trip, we walked for miles at amusement parks. I mean, miles right. and miles and miles. And, and on that trip, we swam with manatee. And on that trip, we walked for miles and miles <laughs> and miles. Uh, in zoos, and, and, and then we walked some more for some shopping, and then we walked some more, and then we swam some more, and we walked and walked, and this was so thin. I understand, you know, what that's like, and you know, I, I, I tried to wear my, my best shoes, but to no avail, my beautiful feet got some blisters. Uh, we walked and walked and walked. I, I, I'm trying to stress this for a reason because. Um, because some of you should know that if you ever go on a family vacation with disturbance, you will not rest. I, I, I need you to know that, that if we ever ask you to go, you should count the cost. Don't, don't ever go on vacation with us thinking that you're people we're going to work if you go on vacation with us i literally lost seven pounds on that trip after a couple of days of walking and walking and walking man we walked and and i lost weight and we ate good but we walked and i lost a lot of weight and, and until until we got home you know we we got back home and and within a few days, I found all the weight that I lost, like every pound, every every ounce, I, I found it all, plus some. You know, it all came back in surplus. And so needless to say, ladies and gentlemen, I was a little bit discouraged as a result. And so I stopped working out for a while. Just, just for a while and, and and there are people in this room right now who I don't know and there are people who are watching online that I've never seen before and so I don't know anything about you but what I do know is that all of us in this room have at least one thing in common and that is experience discouragement Man. am I in the room today I think that maybe as a kid you worked hard on a school project and and maybe you skipped parties to work on this project and maybe you stayed up late at night to get these things done and, and maybe you even got a little bit of help from your parents and at the end of all of your efforts you found out that you got a C or a D or maybe even worse on that assignment that is discouraging Maybe there's someone in this room who's been fasting and you've been praying and, and you've been avoiding people and you've been avoiding places that used to tempt you to sin. And one phone call from that one certain person got you back to a place where you promised God that you would never return. That can be discouraging. Am I telling the truth? Yes. 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 Moral failure can be discouraging. And the challenge with being discouraged is that discouragement has a way of making us want to give up. It has a way of tempting us to quit working on ourselves. Dr. Everett Worthington Jr. argues that a fundamental law of nature is that anything that we don't put work into will eventually run downhill. When we don't tend a garden, it produces vegetables for a while, but eventually the weeds will choke out the vegetables. I want you to consider with that thought for a moment, the story of a young man who allowed the weeds in his life to choke out his potential for greatness. Can you just 
think about this for a moment. Can we can can we really engage our minds today? I don't want you to just come to church and just blank out here. I want you to really engage your mind because I believe that we can learn from this young man how dangerous it can be to allow discouragement to cause us to stop working on ourselves because whether if we want to admit it or not, all of us need a little bit of work. In fact, uh, some of us might need a little bit more work than the rest, but that's a sermon for another day. Today, I just want to deal with the fact that all of us need at least a little bit of work. So turn with me, if you will, in your Bibles, if you brought them to Genesis chapter four, I'm going to be reading from the NIV version. Um, I don't believe that I'm less safe for that. And that's just uh, a version that I can understand a little bit better. So Genesis chapter four, verse one, we'll start there where it says, Adam made love to his wife, Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help, and I want you to pay close attention to this. She says, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Mm -hmm. And so I want to pause here just for a moment. You, you are not a mistake. Tell one more person, you are not a mistake. You're not a mistake. It doesn't matter how you were conceived. It doesn't matter who conceived you. It doesn't matter where they conceived you. It doesn't matter what the conditions were. You are not a mistake. And in our text, we are getting a glimpse of the inner workings of a very highly dysfunctional family. If you if you know the story, then you know this to, to be true. Eve. She manipulated her husband. Um, it's quiet in here because the battle of the sexes are going on in our mentality. But the truth is that there was some manipulation there. Uh, but at the same time, her husband willingly gave in. So he's at fault as well. So 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 what get the, what makes things worse is that she manipulates him. He he falls for the manipulation and consciously chooses to go against the will of God. But then he throws his wife under the bus. <laughs> and he even goes as far as to blame God for his own personal failure. And as much as we like to play the blame game, the reality is, ladies and gentlemen, that both of them made decisions that got them kicked out of the garden. Yes. But still, still with all that going on eve still acknowledges that she could not have delivered this baby without god's help Amen. Amen. am i making sense in here yes. 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 Amen. because i don't want you to get stuck on the battle of the sexes I, I want us to move on to how god is trying to deal with us today because as eve recognizes that it was god who helped her deliver this baby she is also recognizing that god is the only one who has the power to give life and i think most of us know cain's story and here at least we know part of cain's story and we know that cain is messy if you know his story you know that he's done some trifling right. things or at least will do some trifling things and maybe maybe cain is at odds with his parents and maybe he's a liar maybe cain is a cheater but in all that he was or in all that knowledge that God made him and made him for a reason. Yes. Amen. That's yes. And just like Cain and, and all of who you are and in, a, all, in all of who you might become, you are not a mistake. Amen. Amen. Uh, I really hope that ministers to your heart today because you need to know that you are not a mistake. In fact, if we maintain that Cain represents us in the text, and I believe that he does to some degree, then we should find comfort in the fact of knowing that God does not turn away from, nor does he ignore even the worst of us. Yes. I believe that scripture reveals that God shows great concern for those of us who are broken. Yes. Yes. David wrote in Psalm 51, 17, my sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. You, God, will not despise. Amen. There's something 
about the brokenness of mankind that God is pleased with putting his hands on to fix and rearrange and, 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 and turn around and, and remold and reshape. I don't care what you've been through. I don't care what you're going through right now. You need to know that nothing about you is unfixable by God. He right. is the master. Yeah, he is the, the master artist. He holds the play in his hands. He knows what he's doing. Yes, yes. Yes. So in Genesis chapter four, verse two, it says that 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 that, that, that the, the narrative it, it, it's really it's really confusing here because because the narrative makes a greater deal over Cain's birth than it does Abel's. Yeah. And Abel's origin story it lacks the drama, it it, it lacks the excitement of it, and it even lacks what we might think is the significance of the next child's birth. Verse 2 simply reads, later she gave birth to his brother Abel. <laughs> the story then skips over everything else about them. It skips everything. We don't know how far apart in age they are. We don't, we don't learn who figured out how to write hieroglyphics first. We, we don't even know if they had a pet dinosaur. We don't know anything about this family. The text doesn't give us any of that, but what it does, it, it gives us not necessarily what we want to know, but it causes us to have to settle for what we need to know. Right. So I want you to imagine, if you will, if you could turn on your sanctified imagination just for a few minutes, and I want you to imagine them around the dinner table with family and friends while they are sharing in great detail how your brother or your sister was born. And, and, and He was 19 inches long and he was just so beautiful and his eyes were this great shade of color and he made the cutest little sound and he squeezed in a certain kind of way. He was a gift from God. Mm -hmm. And then that one was born. <laughs> are you getting this? Are, are, are you seeing that, that what seems to be insignificant, how God makes significant perhaps, and I'm just going to speculate here just for a little bit, but that the rejection of others is what drew Abel closer to God. I'm speculating here, I'm guessing a little bit, but, but is it possible that while everyone else was clicked up, while everyone else was join, enjoying each other's company, while, while everyone else was dismissing and disrespecting and disregarding you, that God is at work building your relationship with him? Is it possible? Yes. I know it feels lonely. But God favors you. Yes. Amen. Amen. I know they talk about you. Amen. But God favors you. Amen. Yeah, I know they spread rumors and they lie on you, but God favors you. So let them talk. Amen. Yeah, let, let them talk. Let them laugh. Let them lie. Let them ignore because the same person that they're rolling their eyes at is the same person that God sees fully and completely. Amen. Can we get braggadocious for a moment? Amen. Just turn to your neighbor, look at them square in the eye, and say, God favors me. God favors me. Oh, come on, tell me, God loves me. God loves if, if, if he had a refrigerator, my picture is on the refrigerator. <laughs> God favors me. I, I know he does. It. And when we shout about that and we cheer about that and we get excited about that because we know the story. We know what happens between Cain and Abel. Most of us do. But, but the truth is that while some of us are, we can't all be Abel. What that means, ladies and gentlemen, is, is that somebody in this room has to be Cain. Child of God, you might be. But you got some cane like tendencies. Amen. Help us. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, you, you might be saved. <laughs> and trifling. <laughs> uh, can, can I preach the truth in here just, just for a moment? You, you might be God fearing and hypocritical. Oh. You might be holy and. Thank you. That's the better one. Yeah. 
God made you. But sin scarred you. Yeah, that's right. Can I say it one more time for the? Yeah, for, I'm gonna say it one more again. I'm about to get real. I'm about to get real crazy up in here. God made you, but sin scarred you, and that's why, ladies and gentlemen, you are so confused. That's why some of us struggle with who we are and who we want to be. And, and since we won't go to counseling, we're going to talk about that just for a little bit today. We're going to talk about this because the text says that Abel kept flocks and and Cain worked the soil. And, and that's important because in order for us to know who we are, we have to examine what we do. Yes. Like that was like so good. Like, yeah. like if I was sitting in the congregation, I would be like, amen, bless God. I probably would have brought 20 bucks up here later on. <laughs> because we have to examine what we do if we're going to really understand who we are because who we like to see ourselves as is not always the reality of who we actually are. What you think of you, the person next to you doesn't think of you. And they like you, and they love you, but you're just not all that. Yet. You have to examine who you are. You have to be sober-minded about yourself. You have to. See, so Abel kept flocks, so we call him a rancher. Amen. Cain worked on the soil, so we call him a farmer. Right. If you preach, we call you a preacher. Amen. If you lie, we call you a liar. If you sleep around, we call you a what? <laughs> such a good church. Such, such good people. So to know who you are, you must examine what you do. Amen. Are you with me? Yeah. So Genesis chapter 4, verse 3 and 4 says, In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering. Abel, and Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flocks. And that makes sense because he is a I need you to understand something before we before we move on from here. I need you to understand that the text gives us no indication, none whatsoever, that God based his favor on the comparison of the two offerings. I know, I know that the, the exodus had not happened yet. I know that there were no high priests that were that were set up. There were no sacrifices that designated how worship should happen at this time. There was none of that. And, and, and I know that some speculate that God's response has something to do with the quality of the gifts, but I believe that where scripture is silent, we should also remain silent. Amen. Amen. And so all we know is according to verse four, that the Lord looked with favor on Abel, favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. And the writer of Hebrews tells us this. He says that, that it was a faith issue. He says in Hebrews 11 and 4 that by faith, Abel brought God a better offering than he did. By faith, he was condemned, as, he was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offering. And by faith, Abel still speaks even though he is dead. And in the book of Jude, Jude writes uh, that he implies in, that, that greed is the problem. He says in Jude 11, woe to them. They have taken the way of Cain. They have rushed for profit into Balaam's era. They have been destroyed in Korah's rebellion. And so what I'm trying to get you to see here with these two verses is that these verses give us a better understanding of the issue because we all know that greed keeps us from giving to the Lord what is right. That's right. And instead, we offer unto him what is left. Faith, faith says, God will supply my need. Greed says, I don't trust God, so I've got to look out for me. But we know, according to scripture, that God is not interested in grudge offerings. Right. Amen. Amen. We know that. We know that he loves a cheerful giver. Right. Right. So in Genesis 4, verse 4 and 5 says, The Lord looked with favor on Abel and favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry, and his face 
was downcast. Then the next verse, the following verse, uh, we see the Lord asking Cain a question that some of us, well, maybe all of us should be asking ourselves at time. He asked in, in verse six, the Lord said to Cain, why are you so angry? Why is your face downcast? When I was in elementary school, there was uh, one of my peers, I guess, one of my classmates. He, he, this, he was a troubled child. I am like, sure, he's probably in prison. <laughs> no, listen, listen, listen. Every single day he had detention. Like, every day. Like, you know, and, 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 and if he didn't have detention, he had in-school suspension. Like, he couldn't go to recess in the fourth and fifth grade. Like, I mean, he, because he would never do his homework. And then, so he'd have to spend recess and detention time doing the work that he didn't do at home. Are you with me? Yeah. Anybody know somebody like that? Yes. All right. And then, on the rare occasions that he did get to go out and play recess with the rest of us, he would get into a fight. And then they pull him out of recess and now he's got detention or ISS again. This was like a constant thing. This is how I remember this kid always fighting. Over the summer, every time I saw him, he was fighting somebody. Like, I mean, there was always something going on with this child. He was so angry. He was so frustrated with people. He was he was so mad at life. It would, you would almost think that even at 10, 11 years old, that he was mad with God. Like, like he was just angry. And some of us, I believe, are like this kid. We are, we're angry with the world for putting in work that we refuse to do. Some of us are just like this kid. We are, we are, we're jealous because they made it and we didn't. Some of us can't stand to celebrate our friends on social media when they're celebrating an anniversary because you can't believe that they're still together after all that fighting and after all that cheating and after all that argument and all that drama and all the separations that they they're still together and we didn't make it and you're mad. And just like Cain, we get angry with other people and we get angry with God, so angry that we stop talking to him, so angry that we stop praying to him, so angry that we become downcast, so angry that we stop looking up to the hills from which comes our help, yeah, yeah. so angry with God. And just like he said to Cain, I believe that God is now asking us, why are you so angry? Why is your face so downcast and, and here I believe is where the counseling begins with God because God says in verse six and seven, he says, if you do what is right, will you not be accepted? Yes, amen. If you do your homework, will you not make the grade? Mm -hmm. I mean, even if you miss 30% of the questions that's on it, that's still a 70, that's better than a zero. Amen. Sorry, amen. 10 is better than zero. Amen. <laughs> If you don't do what is right, will it not be accepted? But then he says, but if you do not do what is right, I mean, this is not rocket science. If you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. But rulership requires work. I think it's funny that people, you know, you remember that song, when I get to heaven, I'm just gonna walk around heaven all day. And I've read my Bible, sir. I've been to seminary and I can't find that anywhere. <laughs> that that's what we're gonna do when we get to heaven. Because the scripture tells us that we will rule and reign with him. And ruling and reigning, last time I checked, requires work. Anybody got a, a job where you're a manager, that requires work. Amen. You gotta tell people when to be there. Yeah. You gotta tell people to do stuff that you know they they already know they're supposed to do. Amen. That's work. Amen. <laughs> Why well, I gotta tell a 40 year old man to get to work on time? <laughs> 
You know what? I, so I was in the military. One of the things that was craziest thing to me, and maybe I was guilty at this at some point. I don't know. It's been a long time. But 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 I, I think about people who who get mad when they're asked to do their job, and I'm like, you signed up for this. This is like a volunteer force. Why are you mad that you were asked to turn the wrench when you went in as maintenance? I don't know, maybe it's just me. I'm trying, I'm trying, so it requires work. And what this means for us, ladies and gentlemen, is that, that, that when you make good daily decisions, you have fewer regrets in life. Yes. 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 Amen. Right. That's good. It means owning mistakes. Yes. It means acknowledging your shortcomings. Yes. It means working on me yes. until I become the best me yes. that God has created me to yes. be. And so professional counselors, they refer to this type of counseling that God has given here as reality therapy, which is based on choice therapy. Oh, I'm sorry, choice theory. All right. So, so choice theory assumes that people choose their behaviors. Let me say it again. Y'all seem a little distracted. <laughs> choice theory assumes that people choose their behavior yeah. in order to satisfy needs or to mitigate the pain that's caused by unmet needs. Now that brings in reality therapy because reality therapy is an approach to counseling that focuses on helping people learn to change their behavior to maximize achievement of their wants and needs. This means that if you want better, you got to do better. I told you it's not rocket science. If you want better, you got to do better. If, if you want what Abel got, and I don't mean being murdered by his brother, I mean the, the favor of God that was on his life. If, if you want what Abel got, then you probably should do what Abel did. This is a good group in here today. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The problem is that requires work. Yes, but like many of us, Cain tries to take what he thinks is the easy way out of this situation. Watch what happens in Genesis chapter four, verse eight. It says, now Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. While they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. As if, as if killing somebody was going to gain him favor with God. What's worse is the mentality here is that is, is that God would be left with only us. And if God is left with only us, then he would have to accept our mediocrity. We're talking about the very God who could cause rocks to cry out right. when we don't. The point that I'm trying to make is that it was never a comparison for God. It was never a comparison. Remember when Jesus died Y'all read about it, right? For y'all to know, Jesus did not. He, 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 he predicted how he would die, how long he would stay in the grave, and when he would raise back up. He predicted it and pulled it off. Right? That's, that's kind of why I worship him, because I'm like, any man who can predict his death, burial, and resurrection exactly in the order it would happen, how it would happen, and actually pull it off and raise again yeah. with all powers in love. Oh, yeah. I kind of trust that guy's opinion. Yeah. 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 All right. That guy bet my life on it. So Jesus, Jesus dies and he resurrects, right? Mm -hmm. Just like he said he was going to do. But the funny thing is that that, that after he resurrects, and I mean, it's kind of not funny, but it's interesting at least that after he resurrects, he's on the beach, right? And he's cooking up like a fish breakfast, you know, like, you know, I love shrimp and grits, you know? Yeah. Um, so, you know, me and Jesus could have got along with, you know, if he had some fish and grits, I would be happy, right? So he's on the beach and he's cooking up this 
fish breakfast and, and then he calls out to these disciples and then they come over to him and they're having breakfast with him and Peter, y'all know Peter, right? Peter's the one who always got something to say, you know? You know, Peter's like, yo, if they try something, I'm cutting ears off. You know, that, that, you know, that that's Peter. He always got something to say. You know, and so so Peter, Peter is the one who tells Jesus, you know what? If, if they, I'll, I'll never deny you. I'm right or die, right? He's like all in, like, I, I, you know, I, whatever, whatever happens, happens, right? Harley tattoos, Peter. You know? and, and, and so Peter, who always has something to say, is now on the beach with Jesus. Right. Understand the last conversation he had with Jesus, he told Jesus that he would never do something that he actually did. He said, I'll never betray you. I'll never deny you. Yeah. He cussed the little girl out for saying, you know that guy. <laughs> he was like, I don't know him. Y'all know the story. Well, I don't know if he called her half a but the scripture said that he, he cursed. Maybe he called her a whitewashed tomb or something. How about that? <laughs> so anyway, so we have Peter. For the first time that we ever read about him in scripture, with nothing to say. Mm. Yeah. For the first time. He's sitting there eating his fish in silence. Mm. Don't want to look Jesus in the eye. Mm. But Jesus calls his name Peter. Mm. Lovest thou me? Mm. I had to go King James. That's <laughs> <laughs> so poetic. <laughs> Lovest thou me? Amen. And Peter responds, yes, Lord. I have firm my love for you. You know I love you. It's Jesus asking him again, Peter. Do you love me? Yes, Lord. I love you. And then the scripture says that Jesus asked him the third time. Bruh. <laughs> love me, bruh. <laughs> and Peter gets offended because Jesus asked him a third time. And his response is typical Peter. You know everything. Why are you asking me this? Check your Bible. This is just this is just a CDS version, the Corey Down Sturdy version. But I mean, check, check your Bible. This is, that's, that's, that's the way it comes across. You know I love you. You know all things. And so the, the, the point of this conversation that, that, that draws us deep is that after he confirms this, Jesus tells him his future or his faith. And then he says, now follow me. Now, I don't know about you, but if somebody said to me, if, if somebody who predicted their own death, burial, and resurrection, and they rose up, and I'm sitting there eating breakfast with them, and then they tell me how I'm going to die, right. and they'd be like, now follow me. <laughs> I'm being a little suspicious. <laughs> because he hadn't put a timeline on this. All he said is that they're going to shackle your hands, they're going to shackle your feet, they're going to drag you to the city. Yeah. Now follow me. Like, oh, well, well, when is this going to happen? <laughs> you know, I mean, I need to be mentally and emotionally prepared for this. <laughs> so Peter does something that we criticize him for. Watch this. It says in, 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 verse, in John chapter 21, verse 20, it says, Peter turned and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved, and I love this part, right? Because you notice who's writing? John. All right. And some of y'all heard me share this before, but this fascinates me. John is writing this, and John describes himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> so John is writing about himself talking about Peter right. and I think John feels some kind of way about Peter that we're just not sure about because John says that Peter turned and saw the disciple who Jesus loved <laughs> following them and then the scribe writes in here, and that's why you see the parentheses there. The scribe writes in there, this is the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and said, Lord, who is going to betray you? He was the one who Jesus loved. 
And when Peter saw him, him being the one whom Jesus loved, he said, Lord, what about him? Him who? The one whom Jesus loved. Jesus answered, if I want him, him who? <laughs> John is like so slick. When I write books, I'm going to name myself the other one whom Jesus loved. <laughs> Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. Friends. today that we are only responsible for doing what God has called us to do. And when we fall short of that, and we all will, we all do, when we fall short of that, we are responsible for doing the work that gets us back on track. Are you understanding what I'm saying? And that work Includes practicing regular disciplines, yes. Amen. daily disciplines. It, it, it requires us to read our word every day. Right. You know, some churches and some churches have very long vision statements. Yeah. Right? Anybody know our vision statement? Huh? Thank you, Jesus. Oh, Lord Jesus. We're going to have to do, we got to do Vision Sunday again. We just did it three weeks ago. We're going to have to do Vision Sunday again. It's, it's literally right there. And right there. And right there, right there. It's like, it's not a trick question. So let me try again. Anyone know our vision statement? Amen. Very simple. Now, this totally destroys the, the, the teaching that I was about to do here, right? Because what I was going to say so profoundly is that if you can't remember it, you can't do it. So if you have a long vision statement, we exist to be blah, 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 and it goes on and on for a good paragraph, you're not going to remember that. So you can't do it. But now I'm considering four words. My <laughs> Where was I? So... <laughs> Discipline. That's where I was. The, the disciplines of reading your Bible every day because if you don't know what the Word of God says, yeah. then you're not going to know how to live. Right. Uh, all right. The disciplines of prayer and meditation. Because if you don't meditate on God's Word, it's never going to stick. Yeah. Are you with me? Yeah. All right. The discipline of worship. Because worship is not just singing songs. Worship is a lifestyle. Can I can I be very translucent with you this morning? I shared with uh, with Udell in the back room. I said, you know, a lot of times I don't I don't come out during worship because because as a pastor, like it bothers my heart to see this room so empty the first thirty minutes of service. Because why don't God's people want to worship Him? So I stay in the back because I don't want to see that. Because I just watch on video so I can see the worship team so that I can worship without being distracted, trying to figure out what do we need to do, what do we need to adjust, how do we get people interested in worshiping Amen. the very one who woke them up this morning. Amen. And service. How do we decide that we're not going to serve people when we call ourselves servants of God? I heard somebody once say, you'll find out if you're a true servant of God the moment someone treats you like a servant. And so we avoid service opportunities because we don't want to be treated like a servant. When Jesus is the chief of servants who got down on his very knees to wash the dirty feet of his disciples, the very people that he came to save are the very people that he came to serve. But we too good. I told you he was going to have some emotional roller coaster moments today. Some of y'all mad at me. 
<laughs> so, finally, we are required to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Yes. We have to think differently than what we've been trained in the past. Yes. Some of us are stuck at 12 yes. because we stop learning what God has been trying to teach us with life lessons because we want to be comfortable with what we know now and not what God is trying to reveal to us through his Holy Spirit. Yes. I'm almost good. Yes. So, uh, I, 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 the homework for you today is to practice some spiritual disciplines of reading your Bible, of meditating on God's word, of worshiping God in your private time. You know, you can often tell when someone doesn't pray in private because it's exposed to how they pray in public. Amen. Yes, sir. You can tell when someone doesn't worship in private by how they worship in public. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. If I get up here and I start trying to pray and I can't figure out Jesus' name while I'm trying to pray, or what, what the what the do, man? You know what I'm <laughs> I need to get good at saying I'm, I'm God's working on me. <laughs> but if I can't figure that out, if I can't figure out how to pray to God in public, it's a sign I ain't been praying in private. Amen. If you can't lift your hands in public, chances are you don't lift your hands in private. Amen. There's no need to pretend. All of our failures are brought out to light the moment it goes public. That's right. Amen. Yeah. Amen. You ain't been speaking no word of God all week. If you get here on Sunday and somebody say, bless God, how you doing? And you can't even figure out a good golly greeting. <laughs> yeah. That's all you got? Yeah. <laughs> All right, all right. But my guess, and I'm just guessing, and I hope I'm wrong, but my guessing is that only one third of the people under the sound of my voice, whether you're in this room or whether you're online, only one third of the people under the sound of my voice will actually do this homework conscientiously. My other guess is that another third will do it some of the time, but only some of it. And my final prediction is that there are some there's someone in this room who won't listen to a single word that I've said. And you would have spent the, the 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 entire 90 minutes of this service wasted. So for those of you who who will become doers and not just hearers of God's word, my promise to you is that you and for the rest of you for the rest of you we can only hope that at some point you choose life my final point here is that godliness is a daily goal I realize, ladies and gentlemen, that none of us are perfect. In fact, Scripture tells us that all of us have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. And that is discouraging. It's, it's, it's discouraging enough for us to allow our failures to quit trying. But the good news is that there is hope. Everybody shout hope. Oh. There's hope for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Yes. And it's hope because Christ died yes. for you and me. Amen. And it's hope because for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believed in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And there's hope because if we could simply confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, Scripture tells us that we shall be saved. Yes. And champions, we teach that when God saved us, he saved us from at least three things. Number one, Jesus saved you from the penalty of death that's over your life. That means that you don't have to pay the price for the sins that you've committed in your life because Jesus paid it all on the cross. Amen. Number two, 
when Jesus died, he saved you from the power of sin that's over your life. That means you no longer have to be slave to the bad habits or to the addictions or to the, the old ways of you living because you now have power over that. But you still got to work that. One on my hip when someone breaks into my house. But if I don't pull that trigger, I'm good as dead. You have power that you're not using. And number three, when Jesus Christ returns for his church, and I do believe that he's coming back for his church. When he comes back, he will save us from the very presence of sin. That's why in heaven there's no more tears, there's no more sorrow, there's no more pain because there's no more sin. The consequences of sin is always separation. Think about any relationship that you have. Any relationship that you have that is in turmoil. Somebody has sinned and it has caused separation. But in heaven, there'll be none of that. What you find there is not separation, but unity. And so I don't know, maybe you're here today and you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Maybe you're watching online, you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Maybe no one has ever explained it that way to you. We make salvation so difficult. But the truth in Scripture makes it so easy to simply confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. And if that's you in here, and you're saying for the first time, I realize that I've been missing out on something so simple and something so good for me. And I don't want to miss out on Jesus another day in my life. If that's you, would you slip your hand up so that I can see if you want to give your life to Jesus today? If you're in this room. And if you're online, just type in the chat, I want to give my life to Jesus. We'll celebrate you. We're not trying to embarrass you or anything like that. I'm not going to ask you to come up front. I'm not going to try to make you spit in buckets or roll over the floor or nothing like that. We just want to celebrate the decision that you made today, if that's you. Maybe you're here today and you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, but somewhere along the way, along your walk with him, you begin to do things and act in certain ways and go places that you know breaks the heart of God. The Bible calls you a backslider. But the good news is that the scriptures tell us that God is married to the backslider. And if you feel a separation from God, it's not because he left you, it's because you left him. But God is waiting with open arms saying, come back home, son, come back home, daughter. I've been waiting for you because I want to love you. And if that describes you, you know that you're distant from God, but you want to reconnect with him and you want to recommit your life and your walk with him, would you slip your hand up so that we can see and celebrate with you? That's you today. And maybe you're here today and God has spoken to your heart and God is telling you this is the place that I have specifically designed to be your church. By church, we mean the gathering of God's people who are equipped to encourage you and to build you up, to help you to become the person that God has called you to be so that you in turn can do the same thing for someone else. See, disciples make disciples. And I know that sometimes we think that we are part of the church. We think that we are disciples. But the fact is, if you are not learning and teaching what you're learning, then you're not a disciple. You're just an observer. But if God is calling you and, and at this moment he's tugging on your heart and he's saying, this is the place where I want you to grow and where I want you to develop and this is the pastor that I have for you in this season in your life. Listen, I don't believe that everybody who comes to this church has to be here forever. In fact, our desire is that we would send people out to do the work of God to reach other people. And then I believe that there are two people who come to this church Two types of people who come. Either you are on assignment from God or you're on assignment from the devil. Amen. But the devil's already defeated. Already. Amen. Amen. That's right. Amen. That's right. Amen. Because there's victory in Jesus. Amen. So if you want to be on the winning team, Amen. you want to be a champion, Amen. now is the time to raise your hand. 
you want to say, this is the place that I want to join, this is the pastor I want to be, this is uniquely qualified to speak into my life. Would you raise your hand if that's you? You decided that this is the place that you want to call home. And finally, maybe you're here today and you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And somewhere along your walk, you've decided, you know what, I want to get baptized. We believe that baptism is an outward expression of an inward reality. It says to God and to the devil and even to the world that I belong to Jesus and I'm not ashamed of it. The last three weeks, we've had 11 baptisms. What I really, the, the reason why my heart really says that is because I think everybody that has been baptized in the last three weeks, I think if my memory serves me correct, is under 30. So regardless of what some people's statistics say, I know that God hasn't given up on this next generation. So maybe you want to join the number today. You don't have to be under 30. Um, but maybe you want to make that decision today that I'm, I want to be baptized. I want to signify that I belong to Jesus now and I'm not ashamed of it. I don't care if you've been baptized before. I'll baptize you a hundredth time if you need it, if you want it. We want to celebrate that moment with you. So if you're here today and you want information about baptism, uh, if, you're, if you're not ready today, we can do it next week. If you're ready today, we can do it today. That's right. Uh, but if you're here today and you're saying that I want to be baptized or I want more information about that, would you slip your hand up so that we can see? Or if you're online watching and you're making that decision, just type it in the chat. Amen. I see no hands going up today. I see that there are no decisions being made. So that says to me that all of us are pleased with where we're at in God. Uh, and that's a good feeling, right, to Amen. some degree. Um, but then I also believe that we should always be striving for more of Him. And so that's where I want to leave this off today with encouraging you to continue to reach out and, and to get closer to Jesus Christ because he wants nothing more than, than to be close with you. And so next week, um, or, or not next week, um, I'm just saying in general, we're going to be continuing in this sermon series. Uh, but next week, we do have a guest speaker that's going to be here um, with us next Sunday. I'm really excited. Um, in fact, that's a regularly though. Uh, about that that's actually how we met Hillary is um, this couple when I was teaching over Campbell I was teaching their kids and um, and their kids uh, had a dance team that joined up with my sister's dance team I think my wife even back in the day and we were much younger and uh, she danced with them as well you know they had it was a really good dance team that they had and um, and her parents are going to be here Sunday. Uh, so please be here. She does float in the prophetic ministry. And so uh, there is, I believe, a word that uh, that God has for you uh, tomorrow. So please, I mean, I'm sorry, next week. So please be here for that. Uh, now, what's going to happen now is if you're here for the first time, my wife and I would really like to greet you. We'd really like to shake your hand and just get to know your name. So would you just grab your things if you're here for the first or second time and head back to the back um, with the gentleman with the big white beard and uh, he will uh, leave some fruit and pastries and maybe something to drink for you if you're interested in some coffee. My wife's headed back that way now as well. And for the rest of you, I think there's a couple of announcements uh, that need to be made or, or if there's not, then um, Alan's just going to come and close us out with benediction. Please be, uh, be mindful if you're not signed up for a huddle yet. Please be mindful, make sure that you get signed up for a huddle because they start this week. And, um, and uh, the Gathering of Champions coming up in October, really excited about that. That is our official uh, groundbreaking, I guess, uh, reopening. Uh, what, what are we calling that? What is it? Our official launch day. Uh, at, the, at, the, at the new location. So uh, October 27th through the 29th. It's going to be a special time. We're going to have a gala or gala, wherever you're from. Uh, and uh, and we're going to get dressed up. I might be in a tuxedo. Right? Um, so, uh, yeah. So, yeah, get your ball gowns, get your tuxes, all that kind of stuff. Cut your hair, you know, trim your hair. Whatever you got to do, we're going to be looking good on Saturday night on the 28th. Amen? Amen. So,